What's your favorite I, weapon? Do you have a favorite? Um, no, I don't. Okay. You know, with, with, you're with, the first person that's answered that way. You know, with, within, within Shobayashi Ru, uh, we train in bow and sai, you know, short weapon, a long weapon. Yep. Um, you know, from Perry Sensei, I learned uh, Kama, Eku, Teko. Um, they all have a place. What's happening, everyone? Welcome back. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today I'm joined by Andy Morris. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And to all of you out there, here we are. We're creeping up on episode 1000. We've been doing this for just about 10 years. Why? Because we are here to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. And if you want to see all the ways that we're doing that at Whistlekick, it's whistlekick.com for the events, the products, the services that we provide. But if you want more on this show, every episode we've ever done, transcripts, show notes, links, photos, all that good stuff, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And a special shout out, today's episode sponsored by Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. If you're new to Kataro, you should definitely check them out. Use the code WK10 to save yourself 10% on a great belt. Um, they do free rank stripes for life. They're, I think they're the only ones that do that. It's kind of an awesome program. They do other really cool stuff. I've got, uh, we've got Kataro. I've got a hoodie in my closet that I love. It's really cozy. Uh, the, my belt, my Kataro belt rides around in a Kataro belt bag. So make sure you check them out. They are part of the reason that we get to keep doing the show and they've actually got something for you, Andy. So Andrew's going to connect you with them and, uh, yeah, I don't even know exactly what it is. It's not the same every time is my understanding, but they like what we do. So they treat our guests well, which is nice, but thanks. Thanks for being here. Let's, let's, uh, let's see where this takes us. Okay. You being Thank, on you. The show. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, you're here, you know, we were talking a little bit before you met Andrew at a training event and Andrew told me, he's like this, you know, we got to have this guy on the show. I really liked him. And, and I trust Andrew, you know, he, he's got a pretty good sense of who's going to make a great guest. So not, not to, not to set the bar too high for you or anything, but I'm glad you're here. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And, uh, it was wonderful to run into Andrew at uh, Dave Aaron's summer camp. Yeah, uh, yeah Dave's been on the show as well. Right, that we did in uh, Rhode Island this past summer. And uh, happy to be here. Cool. So, of course, there is. this is a, a martial arts uh, podcast. And we talk about training and, of course, how training impacts life. And we thread all over the place. But maybe we should get a an understanding, at least a little bit, of you and your training and I'll, and I'll let you answer that however you want. You can, you know, give us some chronological stuff or some why stuff. But how, how about this as a question? What is your relationship to martial arts training? There we go. There's that. Sure. Um, I'm 61 years old now. Okay. And I started training as a young adult. I walked into a dojo when I was 18 years old. Um, and as my life has evolved, uh, my karate training has evolved as well. Um, karate has changed uh, from 1981, 1982 period. I started in uh, May of 1982. Um, and it's changed a lot in terms of both how uh, dojos operate, uh, what dojos focus on. It's changed in terms of the amount of information that's available. Um, when you think about 1982, um, if you wanted to train in uh, karate, you want to train in judo, uh, aikido, um, you would usually look in a phone book. There, are, there were those things back then. Um, or, you know, maybe you knew somebody that trained. Um, but today, you know, we just have a plethora of information. Mm. Uh, the internet makes so much available. Uh, I think that that's a dual edged sword. There's a lot of information that's available. How do you tease out the good information uh, from the not so good information? Um, and then even in uh, print media, um, there really weren't too many books um, in that era. 
uh, about karate, um, judo, aikido. There's some, uh, but not all that much. Um, most of the information that, that we gleaned uh, really, I think, came from from two sources. Uh, one, uh, where we had Japanese instructors mm -hmm. uh, in karate uh, that had come to America um, and started to teach here. And I think that started probably in uh, 60s, 70s, um, and then kind of made its way from larger cities to um, other areas. Um, but also, and, in, and, and I think this is pivotal, certainly in, in my training and experience, um, U.S. service men and women um, who had had the experiences uh, serving our nation um, and had served tours of duty, uh, sometimes many tours of duty um, on Okinawa, uh, trained um, and lived in the culture of Okinawa um, and brought that training back to America. Um, and for, I think for many of us, um, as we've run across uh, those individuals, uh, that's become a really pivotal turning point mm -hmm. in our martial art development uh, on a long-term basis. Um, they had experiences as young people, middle-aged people, uh, training with Okinawan masters who had trained literally from the time that they were teens all the way until uh, the time that they pass away mm -hmm. in the 80s, 90s, uh, in terms of age, um, and did so in a very, very robust manner. And how do you do that? Um, your karate changes and evolves. Um, as you Hopefully. go through life, um, but also it's how you train, how you take care of yourself, yeah. um, who you train with, what are those practices uh, that we do each and every day as we train uh, that ensure that one, we're healthy. It's really important to be healthy if you're going to train for a really long time. Um, and the culture of Okinawa, uh, with, within which karate operates, um, supports that in many ways. And I think when you see that and you see, um, individuals, be they Okinawan masters or their senior students, many of whom, uh, are now Americans who are seniors themselves operate at high levels, uh, that's inspirational. And, and I think for, for, for many of us uh, that cross paths uh, with them, and certainly myself, uh, that was pivotal to my continued development uh, to somebody who's 61 years old, uh, still trains every day, all the body parts still work, the mind is still clear, um, and that's what I do. Um, but also, it's inspirational in terms of I can do that for the balance of my life um, and do it in a very robust manner. That is, uh, what karate has meant to me. My life, um, has also progressed over those years. You know, I went from an 18 year old freshman in college to, uh, somebody who, uh, moves away, goes to graduate school, starts a career, starts a dojo in that career. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, moves back to the Albany area, teaches at his original dojo for a mm. period of time, um, and keeps training. Um, you get married, you have children, your career hopefully continues to grow and expand. Mine certainly, uh, has, um, during those years and how do you balance, uh, life responsibilities, family responsibilities, um, career responsibilities, and your karate responsibilities. And how do you achieve um, that balance over time? Because that balance has different demands on you at different points in time. Mm -hmm. If you have children, uh, and if your children are your priority, which I would submit uh, you 
shouldn't really have a higher priority than your children um, and your spouse, that's going to have demands of time as your family grows. You know, kids need involved parents. They need supportive parents. Um, your career at different points in time, if it continues to grow, has different levels of responsibility. And so does your karate. As you become a, a senior um, instructor, um, you're expected to be able to have a level of competence in what you do um, to be able to teach others and to continue to evolve yourself. So there's this constant like modulation of life, karate, career, and, and you have to be able to uh, make adjustments as life goes on um, because you go through peaks and valleys, I think, of, of each of those things in terms of time demands um, on you. And you need to continue to evolve or you won't be a happy person. <laughs> it, it's, pre it, it, it's pretty simple. You know, you could beat yeah. yourself up about you. You know, your family life. You could beat yourself up about your career. You could beat yourself up about your karate. It's like, okay, how do you balance all of those things in a right framework to keep evolving, realizing that as time goes by, like I've been training, I'm in my 43rd year of training. Mm -hmm. um, many aspects of that life have modulate over time. I'm retired now. I have more time. Uh, rewind that to 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, you, I was training w whenever I could, I would squeeze the training in. But for the last, you know, decade as, 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 the, as the kids moved on uh, to the college and careers and moved. And, you know, I could set aside lar very large blocks of time to to train. And, you know, that's what I do. And um, so you have to be able to accept that. I think that helps. You know, how do you accept where your phase of life is, uh, still continue to progress, but realize you have to be able to balance those things or you're probably going to be a pretty unhappy person or and or um, you're going to be rather unsuccessful in different aspects of life, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's a it's a mature approach that you have to uh, take. And you have to uh, look at life as a long game, and hopefully it is. And where do you want to be at different points in your life um, in order to be, uh, quote, successful and to have the achievement that, that you want to achieve? Um, so for me, you know, I, I started training in... Uh, 1982. Yeah, I, I want to I want to talk about that that sure. early stage. You you mentioned, I mean, because right. you even knew you you didn't just mention the year and your age. You mentioned the month, which tells Absolutely. me that's a really pivotal event, and it, it makes sense. You've been training for four decades. You're in your fifth decade of training. Of course, that's a pivotal moment. But can you take us back to that time, eighteen year old Andy, and and not just the the logistics of the the when and the where, but the why that was something you even started to do because, you know, I started training in the early eighties, a little bit after you, but, uh, you've got a couple years on me. So mm -hmm. I don't have quite the same relationship with that time period, nor do I have the same memory, but I do know martial arts wasn't super common in the early eighties. Right. It was kind of, it was about to go through probably its second growth phase. So yeah. talk, talk to us about why. Sure. Um, you know, I, f I finished high school in uh, 1981. Um, in New York State, you had, you know, compulsory phys ed, where, you know, you're, you're doing your phys ed requirements every day. I was always very uh, sports oriented. Hmm. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, you know, I finished high school. There's no more structure around that. So what am I going to do for like, you know, going forward, join the gym, uh, Nautilus equipment was a big deal in those days. Um, you know, joined Nautilus gym, did that. Um, it kind of got bored of that after a while, uh, but still you know, fulfill my year contract. And, uh, there was a karate school, uh, two miles from my house. And, uh, I literally just like drove down the main road. And there it was, I think there was a, a judo school, uh, closer it operated in a, um, in a shared building, literally next to a middle school. I went to a cemetery. In fact, you didn't, you didn't see too much judo around those. No, it's a little bit, um, 
So I literally like drove down the road, uh, didn't know anybody that w was doing karate. Um, didn't, didn't what, what, why, what were you, sure. were you a fan of, of Kung Fu movies? You know, where, where was this idea planted? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think you started to see things in some of the earlier movies. Okay. Um, you know, you have Kung Fu movies, you have Billy Jack movies, you know, you, you start to see this. But I'm also a smaller uh, adult. I probably like would be an average sized person in uh, in Japan or Okinawa. Mm -hmm. I'm like a, a middle a middle sized frame body at this point in my life on, on a shorter uh, frame. So I'm five foot three. So there's a physical fitness component, but there's also a self defense component. Mm -hmm. So that those I think those are the two things. Thinking back on it, that, like drove me to to go in and say, well, you know, th this could make sense. Let's see what it's about. And, uh, you know, walked in a uh, two story walk up in a brick building uh, just between a suburb where I lived and, and Albany and uh, went upstairs and talked to, uh, I think, the, the assistant instructor at the time. And, um, you know, so I like to take a take a couple of classes. I think it was like two free classes to start. Um, the interesting thing is when you went into a dojo in that era to watch classes, um, unlike today, uh, very few, um, the adolescents, yeah. there's no children. Uh, I remember like two teenagers. I remember their names because there weren't many, wow. um, a small handful of women and mostly men up until the age of there were, everybody's between like 18 and say 35 and maybe a couple of parents that were maybe in their forties, yep. most virtually all men. Um, but the interesting thing is when I walked in, there were people I knew, I didn't know that they took karate. Um, uh, but you know, it, it's a relatively small community in Albany, New York. And, uh, you know, immediately I, I, I knew a few people that had started three months before me. I knew people that started maybe a year before me, um, all from high school. And um, yeah, I took my two free classes. I said, this could, this could be interesting. And I uh, signed up for like three months. And it was like three months or, or a year. Mm -hmm. um, kind of Spartan in those those days, you know, brick building. There's no air conditioning in the dojo. It's flat, flat roof, top, two rooms. Uh, I think we had uh, men's room, women's room um universal weight machine on one side and uh intro classes there and then uh the larger side was the dojo and uh in the summer um maybe maybe the open maybe the windows got open uh, maybe they didn't um and it was uh called albany sado karate at the time um as part of the adirondack uh branch of the world sado karate organization um, and the head of the organization, uh, was Tadashi Nakamura, uh, mm -hmm. Shihan at the time and out of New York city, who was one of the top, the top, um, instructor of Kai Kishinkai and Masayama up until 1976, uh, when he, he left, uh, Sato Karate and created his own organization. Um, so, you know, the, the branch and the dojo, uh, was in that lineage and, um, uh, you know, it was uh it was spartan training and um you know mostly it was guys training i i uh, it, it, you know as, as a as a as a smaller adult on a on the younger side of the age group um you had to learn quick <laughs> i and, remember you know there are some bits that are similar you know i grew up in maine small yeah. town uh the windows in the 12 years I trained in that space, I think we had two or three summers that those windows opened. It was a, an old high school gym. And one of my instructors came out of Kyokushin lineage. So really? those summer classes, I mean, I, I remember it was, it was rough. You would leave <laughs> in a puddle. It was, it was, it was such standard practice that 
I didn't come from a family that, that swimming was a big deal, but we would keep a couple towels and a bathing suit in the car. And after class, most summer nights, go in the, the bathroom, change, and jump in the lake on the way home because there, there, there was no way my mother was going to let me stand in the shower long enough to cool off. No, I mean, I, uh, you know, as, as you bring that up, I, I remember times where, um, you know, it was a lot of um, master of motion, I would call it. Mm. Lots of basic punches, lots of basic kicks, lots of stances. Mm -hmm. um, you would do kata um, without really understanding uh, sure. what you were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of physical conditioning, you know, sit-ups duck walks, uh, push-ups, and the like, and kumite. And, you know, in the summer, it was pretty common that you'd look into the dojo, and it's foggy in the dojo. You know, the heat, heat's literally coming off of people. Um, great way to cut weight because you would, you know, your, your gi pants would be tied tight before class, and then, you know, you go to change, and they literally just, like, like slide right off your body. It was... Uh, did, we did, young, you guys, so. did you practice break falls because you needed them slipping on the hardwood in other people's sweat? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we, you, you, you learn everything, everything <laughs> you need to do. So, uh, yeah, you'd have that, you know, it is it is an interesting training experience. Sure. Um, it definitely taught you perseverance if you were going to stay. Mm. Um, and, you know, we saw a lot of growth in the dojo in that era. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was, it was solid physical training. Um, and, and, you know, met, uh, I mentioned a minute ago, like if you stayed and, and I have, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my instructor was, was Bill Reed Sensei, who, who I was with for, for many years, early years of my training. And his instructor um, at the time uh, when they were part of Sado Karate uh, was Frank Rossetti, who headed up the Adirondack branch since then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, promotionals, like, were a big deal. Like, mm -hmm. they're dressed in suits, three-piece suits sometimes. Um, we'd all walk in and, uh, you know, they're just sit either sitting behind a, a table or coming around testing you. Um, during our promotionals and, you know, uh, I, and I won't forget first promotional, there was a bit, uh, we had a big group, it was probably mm -hmm. like 30 people in, in the first promotion. So it would have been September of, uh, 82 because they were, you know, they were kind of on a, on a calendar quarter and, uh, I'll never forget like Rosetti sensei looks at all of us and there's like 30 people there and he looks down the row and he, he's, always a man of few words. And he said, uh, I just want to let all of you know that you'll be lucky if one of you makes it to showdown. Hmm. So, you know, I'm sitting there, I look to my left, look to my right. So it was definitely going to be me. Hmm. <laughs> and I, but I was wrong. Um, I did. And then one of the other people I trained with, um, I think he had a, 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 a he was, he was out for a little while for some reason, I think he must've missed a promotional. Uh, but he made it in the group, I think, after me mm. or two after me. Um, you know, so it was just a, a Spartan way of training. Um, but that's what we did. That's what we knew. There wasn't much information out there. And the branch uh, and and the dojo that I was part of and, um, and our, our, our assistant instructor, Russ Jerem, says I, has uh had a school in clifton park new york that's, that's mm -hmm. still there and uh there was a lot of growth in the area in in sato karate um you know you, you would have literally a growth of to hundreds and hundreds of people training here um definitely dominated the area i think in terms of number of students training so that coupled with it's pretty insular you know you, you really didn't um go to like open tournaments or open events mm. or share information with people outside the system. So, you know, you're not seeing um, what others may be doing. Um, and at the same time, you know, if you're going to practice karate in the area, this is where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I, you know, made a good number of friends there. I'm still friends with many of them all these years later. And uh, so, you know, that's how it started. And I had gotten um, all the way to advanced brown belt. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was at the time that I was graduating from college. So I went to college locally. Um, and I get a, a graduate fellowship to go to graduate school in Washington, D.C. Um, what were you studying? I, took, uh, I was going to study public administration there. So I was going for a, a master of public administration, top four program in the country. And I got a fellowship to go. So I'm going. Yeah. Um, but I'm also brown, an advanced brown belt and brown cue in, in my karate training. Was that was um, that a dilemma for you? Had you considered no, not taking it? No. No. It, it, it was not a dilemma at all. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer and I've always been a firm believer that uh, education is important uh, to your career. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you if you get uh, a fellowship at a prestigious school and what you want to study uh, that will affect the rest of your life, um, you go. Yeah. So I was going. Um and I did. So it's like, okay, how do you now continue to train, uh, develop your karate? And also, you know, you're 400 miles away. So how, how are you going to navigate this? Um, our training, you know, was, I, I went through earlier with the fundamentals where you're mastery motion, you know, you could do, uh, hundreds and thousands of basics. You can go over your material. Um, you could do your self-defense. You could do your Yakasuka Kumites. Um, and you could do that whether you're in the dojo um, or whether you're 400 miles away. What you can't really uh, simulate is the Kumite that we went through. Um, but um, in order to develop during those years before I moved away, um, you know, I work with with my instructor a lot in terms of okay, how do I um, craft my abilities uh, to do kumite? We used to do a lot of heavy bag work in those days. Uh, there'd be off days of karate. You know, I would be there. I, w- I would do like 15 three minute rounds on, on the mm-hmm. bag with kicks and punches. You know, I'm training like like a boxer. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, so but that was, that was fairly common coming coming out of that lineage. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So you for know, those of you so, out there who, who've heard of the hundred man kumite, that's a that's a Kyokushin thing. Oh yeah. So you know, I go away. Um, the, the interval it's not like you're going away for two years all the time. You know, you're going away for four semesters. Mm-hmm. You're home on Christmas, home on the summer, uh, sometimes on break. So, you know, keeping, keeping myself in, in good physical condition. Um, and then when I come back, you step into the dojo and you, you work, I would say more on Kumite cause that's the thing that, you know, you, you, you need to work on more. Um, I think the, the challenge is, okay, how do, how do I sink back in with the group of people I was training with because they're back at the dojo training and I'm, mm-hmm. uh, you know, 400, uh, miles away. Uh, when I came back after my first year, um, the impression I had leaving was, you know, keep training hard. And, you know, probably that June, uh, there's going to be showdown promotional, uh, you, you would be eligible for that. Um, I came back, uh, my name wasn't on the list to go to the promotional. Um, and I under I understand it. Um, How'd that feel though? That was, uh, Did that hurt? Well, I think it, I think it could have, uh, because I came in like I didn't, you know, miss a beat. Uh, you know, the, the, the feedback I got from my instructor was, you know, the group that's going is, is a, is a pretty good sized group. Um, just keep training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your skills are there that you should be with that group, but you aren't with the group, just keep training and we'll make sure that, you know, it happens in the future. 
And I'm like, well, okay. You know, they come back. Uh, they have their, their black belts now. I have a brown Q. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, life goes on. So you just keep on training. Sure. Uh, head down. Just, just keep at it. You know, you, you trust the process. You trust the system. Go back to school. And, uh, you know, my, my instructor uh, gave me a call that fall and said, you know, um, made arrangements for you to, to go down to New York City uh, to test with uh, Shannock Moore. Wow. And what had happened is the, the, the previous promotions uh, for maybe the last year were done uh, in the Albany area because the groups, you know, were, were, were getting bigger. Um, but before that, people used to go down to New York City and, and, and Shinakamura would, would test them in the city. So for me, it's like, oh, wow, you know, I'm going to get to go to the city like, mm -hmm. like the guys used to uh, and go down to Shans Dojo um, for my promotional. Um, so uh, that fall, um, I, I was pretty fortunate. You know, things work out well. One of my good training partners uh, who was in the group uh, before me, um, doesn't he, uh, through, I think it was the, the army, he was, he was in the army reserves. He gets stationed at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. So he's like a half hour away from me. Um, so every weekend we would get together and train. So he, he basically, you know, we train on the weekend. He's getting me ready for my promotional a couple of weeks before my promotional. That was uh, December 7th, 1986. Um, my instructor, Bill Reed, and my training partner and me, we, you know, we, we leave Albany at 3.30 a.m. Uh, we arrive in the city because it's 7 a.m. Promotional starts, myself and uh, Nancy Lanou from Chicago. Uh, she came in. Uh, I was tested for Shodan. She was tested for Nidon. Uh, probably... Uh, 30 or so of uh, Shen Nakamura's uh, students show up. And, uh, and there you go. So for me, you know, those are all, you know, you look back on it, it's everything, you know, fell into place. Mm -hmm. um, I had, you know, a, a great promotional, hard, physically sure. hard, as you, as you may well imagine. Um, come back, fly back to D.C., and I finish up my uh, semester and then, you know, kind of, kind of back at it that uh, spring, spring of 87, uh, kind of a pivotal period. Uh, my instructor um, broke away from Sado Karate, um, as did his instructor, uh, Frank Rossetti. So it's interesting. They were the Adirondack branch. They had the biggest schools in the area uh, at the time. Uh, let's see, fifth Don and fourth Don respectively. And they both uh, left uh, Shannon Moore's organization. And then they both uh, created uh, separate standalone organizations for themselves. Um, you know, my, my default is I stay with my instructor, which I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't come back to Albany because I got a presidential management fellowship um, and joined the uh, U.S. Department of the Treasury wow. uh, in May. Um, so, you know, that that's a two-year commitment. Uh, I joined U.S. Treasury. Uh, phenomenal opportunity for me. Uh, there are only 200 in that period, 200 selected every year uh, from the nation's graduate schools. Um, so I joined us treasury, uh, I'm a showdown now mm -hmm. and, uh, but a different organization. Um, uh, but you know, the, 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 the karate as I knew it, uh, you know, didn't change all that much. Um, and, you know, you, you go forward so that, so, you know, there, there's my career launch and there's my, you know, black belt learning launch as a showdown, um, and that was an interesting period of time for me. Um, still training hard, uh, got the career uh, going, um, started to get a yearning to teach. Um, had already, you know, teaching as, as an assistant instructor um, back in Albany, 
which, which was an expectation of, of all of us, as, you know, as we moved up in rank. Um, and I think it was probably the spring of 1989, I started mm -hmm. teaching uh, karate with the Arlington County Recreation Department. Uh, I, had, I think a kids class and adult class. And before I knew it, I had 70 students um, in, my, in, my, in my classes. Um, and I think that, that created some challenges for me, but also for Arlington County. The, the challenge for me was, you know, it's growing. Um, but the flip side of that was the, the county uh, had to organize space for us mm. for a group that's growing. Like, where are they going to put you? So we were just bounced all over Arlington County. I mean, we weren't like, I, I think one of my last places was in a gymnasium that, that worked out pretty well. Uh, but sometimes we were like jammed into like small, like art rooms and not enough space. And I'm getting there early. I'm cleaning because uh, cleaning people hadn't come through mm -hmm. and it's growing a lot. And um, so I think after about a year, year and a half of that, uh, I found my own uh, commercial space in Arlington and uh, rented that for a period of time uh, in, in a great corridor of, of Arlington. Uh, if, if you've been there, it's uh, right near the Boston Metro stop. You would never recognize it, Jeremy. In, in that period of time, it was a, a bunch of low rise buildings and a couple uh, two story buildings. Arlington County um, seized all the property through eminent domain um and turned it over to developers into this and now you go there and it's like you know it's all developed uh there's hotels there's business complexes everywhere um it's like okay now what are we going to do because the building that i just rented is now uh you know going through eminent domain um so i did a share space arrangement which actually worked out great there was a a, a local taekwondo instructor moshiki uh, and I was able to work um, out with Mo, shared space arrangement. So I, I would be there a couple of nights a week. He was there because he rented the space. So I subbed off of him. Uh, and I think there are a couple other instructors in there teaching different martial arts down in the Clarendon sec section of Arlington right across from the subway. So, you know, people could take the subway there. I've always wanted to be part of something like that. That's just, yeah, good. And, and, you know, and you, gotta, good. you gotta get the right people it but how, how was that as an experience? Was it positive? Yeah, it was great. Cross training? Uh, no, it wasn't no. much cross training. Um, you know, it was, you know, some people were doing Taekwondo. Um, Mo, Mo, Mo had a printing business on one side of, of Wilson Boulevard and on Clarendon Boulevard. Went, the buildings went all the way through. So he had a dojo on the one side on Clarendon Boulevard and had a pass through where he, I think he had his printing business on the other side. And um, I think we were the only ones that were there the nights we were there and, and conversely as Taekwondo school was there a couple other days of the week. Um, so, you know, it worked out really well. And, um, and then, you know, we were there for a period of time and then I, my wife and I, uh, had got married. We, we were both, uh, in the earlier phases of our careers and the, the cost of living in the Washington DC area is very high. Like, it was oh high God. then, and it's through the roof now. And um, you know, I roots in the Albany area, and um, we we made a decision to uh, look to see if we get positions in Albany, and we did. Uh, so I joined the state tax department. Um, my wife joined the New York State Division of the Budget, um, and that's how our uh, Albany-based careers were launched. Uh, and that was in March of 92. It was hard to leave my dojo. Uh, sure. It's hard to leave my students. Um, but, you know, the, the seniors in the dojo, they, they stepped up and uh, they kept training and they had each other. And eventually, you know, they worked them, themselves up to be uh, Sandans in, in, uh, in that system. Okay. And how uh, long did you have that program? About three years, three, okay. maybe three and a half years. Okay. Um, you know, so, so they were at the point where, you know, there were enough of them that could train together. And then my in-laws lived in Arlington. So I'm going back and forth. 
you can still guide them. And, then, do, and they're, yeah. com- they're coming up here to train, staying with us. And, um, and then, uh, you know, so that's, that's 92. Um, that kind of, that kind of gets me through that first phase of training from, uh, so now I come back to Albany back, uh, training and teaching at the dojo that I had started with all those, you know, years earlier. Um, but I'm, you know, 10 years older than I was in those days. And, uh, you know, I, I, because I was going back and forth, a lot of the, uh, a lot of people I trained with, you know, they knew me and I, and I knew them. A lot of the younger people didn't, you know, they would hear about him, about me. They'd hear about my wife, Phyllis, who would also train with me. Um, but I usually come back for, you know, black belt events, uh, special training. So, you know, that, that, uh, so I, was, I would say a little bit of a new entity, um, uh, for the students that were there. Um, but that transition, you know, was, was, easy because at a place to train at a place to teach. Um, then probably around 94, um, the dojo started to become involved with the AAU karate program. Mm. Um, and that that's important because it kind of opens up this, uh, lens of karate. So in the earlier phases, it's quite insular, you know, the exposure Mm. outside, which is um, common for, for that, you know, that eighties era of martial arts. And, uh, you know, the, the internet that we see today, while it was, uh, you know, principally developed for universities and researchers and the government, um, even until I would say the latter part of the nineties wasn't a widespread use. Um, but what the AAU provided to us and, uh, Paul Frackia, Xian, uh, was a very senior, uh, Shitoru practitioner in the U S and, and still is, he headed up the, uh, AAU, um, in this area, in the Adirondack mm-hmm. region. Um, so we started to go to tournaments, uh, started to have cross training and some other systems. So, mm-hmm. you know, Shan Frackia would, I would say, teach it or make available to us a uh, kata that if we we're going to compete with, um, would be more readily accepted in AAU circles. Um, and uh, Shan John Druin who, uh, you know, was a senior practitioner in both Shoran Ru, Shoran Khan and Shido Khan. Um, he uh, came and he's, he was from, at the time, Auburn, New York. He came in a strategic Kobudo. Mm. It was the first time we'd seen Okinawan Kobudo, you know, Sai, Aku, Bao. Um, and he came and, and taught us that. So our curriculum is starting to grow mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, tournament setting, some of us started to compete nationally, referee nationally, coach nationally. And then it's like, wow, you know, there's a lot of really solid karate, uh, both Japanese systems and Okinawan systems in America. And, and, you know, when, when you see it, uh, among those that are, you know, a little bit younger than you or in your age group or senior to you, and the referees are senior practitioners in the U.S. of many of the systems. Uh, it opens up your eyes, mm. and um, that was interesting. But also, um, and, and for me, this was a, a really pivotal moment. And I, I look back on it, and uh, key to my development. Uh, my former organization. And, uh, and Shan Frakia, uh, co-sponsored a, uh, a summer train or a, it was summer. It was fall. It was like September of 95 up in Lake George, New York, beautiful setting. You know, it's in the Adirondack mountains, beautiful spot. Uh, yeah. And, and camp Chingachuk is right on the beach. It's a YMCA, um, camp still in existence. And, uh, you know, we, we hear on a Saturday afternoon of a three day training, 
uh, there's going to be this uh, senior practitioner of Shoran Ru, uh, Shobayashi Ru. Uh, Bill Hayes is going to come and, and do a seminar. I go. This is this is great. So uh, you know, exposure to other people is always a good thing. And um, and I look back on it, and you know, we go into a beautiful large building, and uh, you know, four or five years removed uh, from being a major in the U.S. Um, Marine Corps is Bill Hayes Sensei, hmm. and uh, introduces himself. And says to us, uh, you know, I'm a, a longtime student of uh, Ezo Shimabukuro, Okinawa Shoranru, uh, Shobayashiru teacher. And my mind starts to race. And I'm thinking back. And I'm like, wow, I've, I've heard that name before. I've read it. And uh, 1987, Patrick McCarthy Sensei releases a book, a class of, of uh, Okinawan Karate. And in there is a picture of Shimabukuro Sensei. And it talks a little bit about him. Uh, in 93, uh, Jim uh, Sylvan Sensei, who's passed away, writes a book about Okinawan uh, styles and masters. And there's a picture of Yezo Shimabukuro, mm -hmm. page and a half devoted to him. Um, we just and, released an episode. I, I don't know if you caught that. We just released an episode. I did about him. Great. But please, please. And, and also just want to acknowledge that Patrick McCarthy's also been on the show. Great, great man. But please continue. Yeah. You're tying, you're tying it all together. Um, to. so, you know, so here, here we are fall of, of 96 and, and, and Bill Hayes Sensei is standing there and talking to us just, you know, briefly about his background. I'm like, wow, you know, he's trained with Yezo Shimabukuro. Not only is he trained with him, uh, but his training goes back to the 70s, 60s, mm. 60s, 70s, 80s, into the early 90s as a senior student of Ezo Shimabukuro during his uh, you know, extended tours, uh, three tours uh, on Okinawa, a couple in Japan where he'd fly down and live with Osensei when he's going back and forth. And we're there, and he starts to go through uh, the meaning of motion. Now, we had spent many years doing, you know, master of motion. You know, you're going to step forward, you're going to punch, here's where your punch is. Um, and then you watch and you see Sensei, and he starts to talk about movement, angulation, mm -hmm. timing, uh, Mato. Where do you strike on the human body? Hmm. Tute, toy day, uh, joint locks, attacking reactions, cone of vision, cone of power. It starts to lay this all out for us. And then he demonstrates it. And at the time, I was a Yandan. I was a 4-3 black belt. <clears throat> and it caused me to really question... What do you really know? Hmm. You know, by then I've been training for 13 years. <clears throat> We'd spent a lot of time mastering the motion. Meaning of the motion. Was that unsettling? Uh, because I, I've been through that. I've talked to others who have been through that. But just there, there was something in your face that suggests. Yeah. Uh, unsettling in terms of. <clears throat> what's missing, mm. you know, here, here, here I see a very senior practitioner of Okinawa Karate <clears throat> being able to demonstrate at levels I hadn't seen before <clears throat> Karate. Mm. Yes, a punch is a punch and a kick is a kick. A block is quote a block, even though they're not, they're strikes. Um, you're able to see it and see it demonstrated in a way that it's like, how do you get there? <clears throat> Are we big fish in small ponds? How big is the lake? How big is the ocean? 
how much more is there to learn if you're if you're going to make it a lifetime endeavor and how big is that gap that you need to close um and those are all my words sure but from my perspective it quite it, it causes it caused me to step back and say that's a level i haven't seen before what do i have to do to get to that point and i think that that was the reaction of many people that saw what was done mm -hmm. Powerful. But it's uncomfortable. Right? Yeah. If you're if you're going to grow in life, sometimes things are gonna be uncomfortable. Yeah. And you have to realize that and say, Okay, you know, where do you go from there? Hmm. So kept training. I'm I'm a big researcher. Um, Patrick McCarthy sensei releases the Bubishi much deeper look at the linkages between, uh, karate, Okinawan karate, Chinese martial arts. Mm -hmm. Hey, sensei, uh, releases, uh, he, he's covered in fighting arts international in Britain, uh, Terry O'Neill published mm -hmm. that for many, many years, uh, sent his two lengthy articles in there about his training on Okinawa mm -hmm. with Osensei. Um, on Ante comes out, John Sells Sensei puts out a huge book uh, and that's in, uh, I think 95, uh, secrets of, of karate documents, extensive, um, documentation about Okinawan styles, mm -hmm. lineage charts, uh, Shobayashi Shorinru is in there. Hey Sensei, his name is in there as one of the senior practitioners, along with some other first generation, some, not all, uh, students of O Sensei. Um, then Hey Sensei releases, you know, My Journey with the Grandmaster, uh, which recounts part of his personal experiences studying with uh, O Sensei. Uh, that comes out in 97. 97 and, and in 98, Hey Sensei comes back to the capital region, goes back to, to the dojo they train with, does a couple more sessions with us. Um, he, at the time he was, he was living, uh, he had retired from the Marines as, as a major, living in Stafford, Virginia. And um, I mentioned earlier, my in-laws live in Arlington. Mm -hmm. So they're 40 minutes away from Stafford, Virginia. And hey, Sensei, um, I think some of us are starting to find where he's at in terms of his seminars. Uh, where, where's, where is he teaching? Where, where's, where is he training groups of people? And um, one of the things he had mentioned to us was that um, every August, sometimes it's September, usually in August, is Little Okinawa, where his friend Doug Perry, uh, Sensei, put on a uh, three-day, four-day training in uh, Flat Rock, North Carolina. Hmm. Um, and hey, Sensei is like, well, I'll be there, and but there'll be other other people there too. It'd be a great experience for for people to come. So I think it was probably, um, you know, ninety seven, ninety eight. Um, I'm like, I think I'm going to go great place for me to learn more weapons. Uh, Shan John Druin, uh, had, had taught us uh, a bunch of kata, um, out of the lineage or close lineage of that. Uh, we learned some of the Shoran, uh, Shoran Khan material. He'd also done Shidokan. So, um, I'm like, I think I'm going to go. So. I fly down, you know, I'm out of a Japanese system that's unknown at Little Okinawa, uh, Okinawan practitioners. Um, I, I get all the material, I send it down, show up to registration, and, and here, here's this uh, gentleman 
who I had seen before uh, refereeing at a U national tournament that I competed at in Greenville, North Carolina. I was in the same group uh, as his son, Jason Sensei, uh, all these years before. And I, I, I go there, I sign up, and and who is it? But it's uh, Hey Sensei's good friend, uh, Doug Perry Sensei. Mm. Uh, That's a home. name that I that I knew prior to our conversation. I, I don't know yeah. where from, but yeah. well, he's a uh, he, he's a gem. Uh, Perry Sensei at the time had headed up uh, North American mm. Shore Ru Shore and Khan. Uh, organized little Okinawa, produced phenomenal uh, students, uh, young students, middle-aged students, older students. Uh, I don't know how he worked his magic, but I, I go, I go back now and I watch, he used to call them the rug rats. Everybody gets a nickname, you know, the rug rats. Hmm. He had teen students that I still look at how they were when they trained. Um, and it's amazing. Hmm. He's that good of an instructor. So I show up. There's Doug Perry, you know, he's from North Carolina and he puts his arm around me. Andy, pleasure to meet you. If there's anything here at this camp that you want to learn, it's here. Just ask for it. And if you have any problems, any place, just come and see me. Hmm. I was like, wow. I just met, he taught me, he, he treated me just like, you know, one of his own students there. Um, he's a friend to this day. So you go to Little Okinawa. And, and what was it? Um, because I think 20, 2017, 2018 was the last year uh, that, that, that Sensei had it. Um, you would go there. Um, you could go to any of the uh, instructor, you know, with the schedule that the instructors had. But it's who's there. So you'd have uh, Bill Hay Sensei. Shobayashi Shoranru, Doug Perry, Shoranru Shoran Khan, close friends, Jim Logue, senior practitioner of uh, Seo Oyata Sensei, good friends, he's there. Okinawan Kempo, Larry Isaac, Vic Coffin are there, all good friends. Wei Ru. John Curry is sensei, good friends. And it was like that for years. Goju Ru, Kimo Wall sensei. You go to Goju Ru with Kimo Wall sensei. They were all good friends, all served our nation, all mm -hmm. senior practitioners in America, but also very senior within their systems on Okinawa and a sharing of information. You go to any of the sessions that they had and all the information is there for you. You had questions, you ask. During class, outside of class, grab them on the side. And then you had informal classes. Hmm. So a number of us would go there and we would be, we would pester his sensei to teach us more. So he was already on the schedule we would pester him and then we would find, he would find a place uh, for us to train. It might be a basketball court. It might, might be the amphitheater, a little Okinawa. It might be a little grass knoll and since he's going over material with us. So you would go to little Okinawa, special moment Saturday night, they would have a big demonstration. Uh, sometimes it'd be the senior practitioners, but sometimes it would be their students would come out and, uh, you know, for two hours, you just see phenomenal karate, uh, the most down to earth people, friendly, respectful of each other and each other's systems. And they all knew each other back to the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands, two thousand and tens, but it's a sharing and it's a community. And I think that's a great lesson. So, um, you know, I, I think we made great bonds when we did that. So for me, you know, you show up at Little Okinawa and you're, you're, you're welcomed to learn anything there. 
we could ask all kinds of questions. So in one, you know, in one respect, it was unsettling back in 95 to see karate done at that level. But the flip side of that is it provides so much more of an opportunity to go and learn and develop and evolve uh, within your choice of system. So, you know, when, when I went there, I do, I do Kobudo today. Uh, What's your favorite I, weapon? Do you have a favorite? Um, no, I don't. Okay. You know, with, with, you're the with, first with person Shob that's answered that way. You know, with, within, within Shobayashi Ru, uh, we train in bow and sai, you know, mm -hmm. short weapon, a long weapon. Yep. Um, you know, from Perry Sensei, I learned uh, Kama, Eku, Teko. Um, they all have a place. You know, some are shorter, some are longer. Um, I enjoy Kabuto because it, um, you know, provides a great balance to empty hand. Um, you're also working both both hands together, mm -hmm. which uh, meal today, you know, we, we, we train both hands should be doing things. Um, and Kobuto requires us to have both hands doing things at the same time, much like our karate should. Um, so no, I, I, I enjoy all of them. So, that, you know, I, I still do Eku, uh, Kama and Teko. Uh, they learned at Little Okinawa to this day. I always have, mm -hmm. always will, along with, um, you know, my bow and, and, and Sai and Shobayashiru. Um, so I, I think, you know, he, he, by going there and, and the other thing was I also, uh, for the first time there and at other events ran across Shobayashi practitioners all trained with Hey Sensei. Um, and you know, we, we get together, uh, twice formally every year, but we also go to his other trainings that he has around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and we all get together. It's, it's like a, you know, brotherhood, sisterhood, where we, you know, we all learn together. We're all colleagues in learning. And I think that's important to recognize that, you know, regardless of the, the grades that, you know, that, that we've achieved, um, we continue to evolve in our training and, and, and our students of the art. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that's a, a, a an important point, I think, um, and, and through Okinawan Karate and those organizations I mentioned, um, I, I have friends in other countries, I have friends across America. Um, and, you know, earlier we, we talked a little bit about how I, I ran into Andrew Adams um, down in Rhode Island at, at Dave Aaron's uh, dojo, yeah. where I was uh, part of the instructors uh, there this past summer in, in August. And, you know, David and myself, we go back to the Lokanao, mm -hmm. you know, we were, we were pretty young men in those days. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've, uh, we've all evolved and developed and I, I, I'm proud to call him a friend, but also proud of, to see, you know, what he's done with his karate and with, with his school, you know, within it, um, and, and his approach, uh, to how he conducts himself um which is important um uh, as senior practitioners as well you know what is that ethos how, how do we interact with each other uh both in the dojo but also outside the dojo and and, and what's our role in in the larger community um so I, I would say that that's probably um you know that that middle phase of my development uh was really broadening out um you know, who I interacted with, uh, starting to develop where I want to go. Mm -hmm. There's also tension though. I think part of that tension is you hit on earlier, you know, what, what was that discomfort in, you know, the fall of 1995, you know, you're, you're, you're a fourth down in karate, but you know, for the, for the first time you really sit there and you're like, wow, you know, how much is there to learn? You know, what's, what's that level of discomfort? Uh, and, and I would say that um, part of that is defining where you want your art to go and where are you spending your time? So for me, 
you know, I, I was kept up with my material within the system that I was part of. I continued to get promoted eventually, um, you know, past my, my grade to go down for three black belt in 2001. Uh, but my karate from 1995 until 2001, uh, looking back on it was changing a lot, mm -hmm. uh, changing in terms of, uh, looking at application. Uh, what are we actually doing? What's the meaning of the motions? But, but uh, here, here, here's a question. Cause I'm also, sure. we're watching time. Um, I'm sure we could go another two hours. Unfortunately, logistically, okay. I don't have, right? So sure. what, what I'm looking at is another 15, 20 minutes, but I want to make okay. sure, because we've got this arc of story here, and I want to make sure that we we sort of complete the arc. But there's something you've come back to a couple times that, that I want to, I have my own views on it, but I, I want to get yours. You're talking about, I mean, to oversimplify it, you're talking about quality and dedication to basics, foundation, fundamentals, whatever you want to call, you know, if we use Japanese terms, kihon. And you're, you're talking about this more applicable material or advanced material, however you want to look at it. And I, some folks out there who were not raised in this way, because I was raised in a very similar way could look at that and they might be looking at this transition as abrupt or unfortunate. And my question, as I've set this question up now is, would your ability to have explored this more advanced material been as productive or efficient without your historical attention to these basic movements? Sure, um, and I'll be brief. You have to have fundamentals, no matter where you are. You know, it, when, when, you look, when, you, when we look at our, our karate, we look at like a Venn diagram. So you have, you know, you know the striking piece, you know, we call You're it- You're only the second piece. person to bring up Venn diagrams on the show. I'm, All right. I'm the other one. I've met. All right. <laughs> please, <Got it>. please <laughs> continue. <laughs> I'm so, so excited. So, three, so you got like three pieces, right? A teme to dome, you know, striking, yeah. striking things, for lack of a better term. You have Q show, uh, you know, where you hit though, makes a big difference. Tute, joint locks. Uh, and I think most of us, as, as we start and learn, you know, we're, we're kind of in that, you know, striking phase, you know, I'm trying to master those motions uh, kicking, blocking, punching. Uh, but then there's these other phases that make an enormous difference. So, you know, we look at karate as life protection art. Mm. It's, it's not, it's not a sport. I'm not going to go to a tournament, do it. Can't rules, all those other things. Mm -hmm. If you look at it from a life protection art perspective, important to develop those things. Sure. So, you know, foundational abilities, uh, in it, yes, you have to have the ability to, to do those. Um, how long does that take? You know, it depends on on the individual. Um, would I would I eventually be where I where I am now without having done that? I think you know there there are fundamentals that certainly um, are necessary. You know, you, you, you can't do karate no matter what the system is if, if you just like can't punch a target. And, you know, it just doesn't work. You, you can't, you don't know if there's any high, low, middle. Uh, you, you can't do some fundamental uh, blocks. Uh, we, we teach them in the advanced levels, they're all strikes. You can't do those things. I think the biggest difference is the appreciation of where you are. Hmm. I have a deep appreciation for where I am now based on having those fundamentals and knowing another side of another art. I learned initially a Japanese based system and then moved to an Okinawan based system. They're different. Mm -hmm. Okinawa is part of Japan. You know, we, I won't go into the history. That'll take us a long time. Yes. It's a prefecture of Japan. Okinawa karate is different than Japanese karate. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I appreciate where I am. I appreciate the depth of what it is. And that's what I strive to do. Mm. And, you know, the, the early years building a foundation, I would say is important to my own development. Um, glad to have had it. Glad to also moved on from that into something that I can train out at a hopefully a progressively high level as I age too. Mm -hmm. I'm 61, as I said earlier. Um, I have every plan of training until I'm done. Mm -hmm. And I believe I can continue to grow and develop across that period. And that's important. It's important to have that belief to do it. And I also have seen with my own eyes, those seniors that I mentioned earlier, the little Okinawa and Hey Sensei, they're uh, standard bearers. They had seen their instructors do that and they've lived it. Mm -hmm. And we get to watch them do that. We get to be on the floor with them as they've done that and continue to do that and their generation ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And we can do that too. So it's a confidence, I think it's a confidence booster. I can continue to do that. There's no nothing that should be able to stop me as long as I also focus on health and wellness mm -hmm. as part of my training. And that's one of the things we emphasize in Shobashi Ru. Yes, there's Makiwara training, Teifa training, Hojondo, Kata, application, all focus on life protection art, but I can't do those things and continue to, continue to train if I'm not a healthy individual, if I don't watch what I eat, watch my stress of life, watch what I drink, don't smoke, you know, all those mm -hmm. things to be a healthy person. Um, if you do those things, then you can continue to progress in your arts and you should, and, and people should be able to watch you progress in your arts. And you should be able to go on the floor and you should be able to demonstrate things to people. And, you know, sometimes you look at uh, people that get to be senior rank in certain systems and they may stand in the back. They may count a lot. Uh, they may move people's hands around a little bit, um, but they're not actively engaged in their training and their art anymore. And I would submit that, uh, that they've done themselves a disservice by that um, because we all have a responsibility as seniors to pass on our art uh, and also pursue that art into our, our senior advanced ages uh, to live up to our rank. Well said. Well said. So uh, if we have time, I got like the next phase. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost in offending myself, but I have to say it this way. Know that I don't mean any offense. Let's talk about this next phase in like a eight minute span. Got it. Let's condense. Sure. Thank well, you for condense. your understanding. Uh, I totally understand. So, um, you know, for, for me then, um, that third phase was really devoting myself to understanding Shobayashi Shonru. Um, and, and training with uh, Hei Sensei, other first generation students of Shimabukuro Sensei, um, and and the seniors within Shobayashiru uh, to continue to evolve uh, in our life protection art, and that's what we train in. Um, and and it's important to recognize what that is. So, you know, we have uh, seniors from all over the US, some of which have, uh, you know, commercial dojos, mm -hmm. some of which don't. So um, it's a group that pursue the art, uh, as we've learned it from our instructor, as he learned it from his instructor, and we continue to uh, pursue really advanced principles of Okinawan Karate. Um, you know, and, and, and most of us, like have devoted decades of study 
to the art uh, to try to really round out what we do. And you know, people ask, geez, you, you go to these seminars, do you still learn things? I would say a couple of things. Uh, one, absolutely, because um, you have to be open to learning. You have to really watch intently and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And there, there's information that I still go back to and read um, of early newsletters that Hey Sensei published. Um, they mean the, the material that's covered means different things to me now than it did then because I'm not the same person right now. It's, can can, can you I say was. that again? Because that's just such an important concept for people. Just sure. Just spend a moment there, please. I can look at the same material that I read in the past that meant something to me then. But because I've, I've evolved in terms of my understanding and abilities, then when I read it today, mean something different to me. And sometimes, because this is also an expectation, I pick up the phone and I call Sensei. Sensei, I get this question about something that was covered in you know, a newsletter back in uh, like 1997. Can we go over that again? And, he, and you know what Sensei does? He goes over with me again. Or, you know, we, we go to seminars and we sit down and we, and we go over the notes and it's like, okay, can we, can we touch on this? Like, this is what I'm thinking. And that's what we do. And that's how we continue to grow. And, uh, that's, you know, him being the leader of our, of our association. Um, but it's also, also us continuing, even though we trained seemingly a quote long time to ask those questions that that need to be asked, uh, that have meaning for us in our karate and how we continue to evolve and documenting it as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have binders of information that I go through on kata and material and, and, and I learn a lot by doing that. So, you know, some of that's introspection, you know, what really is that? Um, so that that's like you know that last phase is continuing to unfold it's you know how do i continue to grow and evolve uh as a karateka as a student of karate even after you know i'm in my 43rd year of training i still consider myself a student of karate there's still a lot left to learn and i accept the fact that uh i'll never learn it all. My only question is how many lifetimes does it take to learn it all? Uh, I'll learn as much as I can, as much as I can comprehend, as much as I can, you know, do and perform at, at, at you know, at levels um, and continue to do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it, it truly is a journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I look back on each of the phases. Um, and, and I'm not a I'm not a nostalgic person like at all. Like I, I rarely look back. So, you know, when we're scheduling this interview, I'm like, wow, I think I got to look back at some of these early, early, you know, earlier phases and, and what did they, that mean? And how to get to where I am. Um, but it's really just, you know, being a student, um, being persistent, having a passion for what you do and sticking with it. Yeah. And, you know, people are like, you train every day. I'm like, yep, I train every day. Um, and, you know, an interesting thing in, in, my, in my work life, as I, as I moved up, uh, you know, the organization, I got exposed to more and more people. They would like to know, like, what, what makes you tick? Like, what do you do that's, that's you know, unique? And, and sometimes people would hear that I like train in karate. And uh, they'd say, well, you know, how, how, much, do, how much do you train? I'm like, I, tra I train every day. And like, really? Like you train every day? I'm like, yeah, every day before I come to work. You know, that that's how I would always get it in because my, my day was kind of endless. Uh, I'm like, well, you know, how long have you been training? And I tell them, and it was probably longer than many of them were alive. And they would just sit there and shake their heads. 
Like, aren't you tired of it? I'm like, nope. Mm. <laughs> There's so much left to learn. So much. The further you go, the more there is. Absolutely. It's, it is, it's for people who like to complete things and check boxes, right? It's, it's frustrating because it doesn't end. It, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a box checker. I'm a planner. And this yep. is that one aspect that, you know, it's Same. one that one aspect of my life that is, um, you know, what do I have to study more deeply mm. to continue to grow and evolve as I want to grow and evolve? Right. Uh, there, there's a, I have in my dojo, I have a, a, a scroll uh, brush by Tetsuhiro Kama, who, um, 10th on PhD overseas, the Okinawan uh, Karate Museum. And it's a uh, Kudo Mujin. And it, it translates to, you know, there's no limit to the study of the way. Mm. And there really isn't. I like that. Hmm. If people want to get a hold of you, maybe we've got some folks who are nearby or they're going to travel nearby, you know, website, email, social, anything like that you can share. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Okay. Andy Morris, you just load me up. There's, there's a picture of me, uh, there's a picture of me. Hey, Sensei, Mark Knox Sensei, uh, Tony D'Angelo Sensei, Tom Ravel Sensei in Chicago from about five years ago. So I'm there. Um, I think uh, Andrew has my info it's also andrew d morris 63 at gmail.com people drop me a note i'm uh i'm in the albany area and i'm not too hard to find great great this is this has been a ton of fun and, and you know for for me i'm not sure how much the audience likes this part of it but for me one of my favorite things now that we've done so many of these episodes is watching how they connect Right. To me, it's not just an episode. I'm talking with a person, but hearing how you connect with all of these other people with mentioning, you know, McCarthy's book and, and, and these other folks that I've I've met or interviewed or heard of is just really fun because it it, it, it in my own trivial, selfish way kind of puts me in the middle of all of these things in the martial arts world over the last however many years and, and that's fun, right? Make me feel like I'm, I'm part of something even if I, I wasn't there. It's like, oh, I know those two people. Okay, cool. Uh, so, that, so that's a good time. And, and for me, and I think for a lot of the audience, that's part of why it's so important that we do transcripts on every episode because you can go and you can search and you can dig in and go, okay, who mentioned this person or who mentioned this thing? And it becomes a lot of first person source material. I have, I have no doubt that you know, many years from now, people will look back on what we have done and use it as as reference, which is fun to, to know that we're doing that. But I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to ask you to close us up in a moment. But before I do, just a reminder to the audience, right? Whistlekick, com, whistlekick.com, all the things that we do. And please go check out Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. They're generous enough to sponsor this episode. And if you're new, you can use the code WK10. If you're not new, if they're not going to let you use the code, I still want you to let them know. Put it in the notes in your order. Love that you're supporting Whistlekick. Something like that. Remind them that what they're doing matters. But Andy, I'll, I'll ask you to close. How, how do you want to leave this for the audience today? Well, Jeremy, thank you know yourself, Andrew, for having me on. Of course. Um, I think how I would leave it is uh, for, for each of your viewers, uh, trying for them to think about where do they want their karate uh, or their other martial art that they may practice to go, have a passion for what you do, and be persistent. Um, and I think if you're persistent, you're passionate, you are, uh, you will have the success an achievement that uh, that you put the effort into and show the passion for what you do. And it's a journey. And, and you should be able to practice your chosen art really for your whole lifetime um, if you do it wisely. Take care of yourself, good health, uh, be well. And I think that's it. <laughs>